Are we doing self service today? Or are we doing self service today? Shall I introduce myself? Ah, uh, ah. Uh, uh. Already started. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's just uh, my homework. Uh, okay, yeah. Because uh, the, the, unfortunately, this is the last lecture, so I, as always, I was slower than expected, so that I will try to cover more uh, today. So let me uh, remind you where uh, we started uh, the last time. So we can see the random walks on groups. And we consider the for given accountable group and the uh, S-step distribution mu, probability measure mu. We consider the associated Poisson boundary responsible for representation of bounded harmonic function. And then uh, the main qualitative question is the following, and that's a natural question. When is this Poisson boundary trivial? So here, one, uh, depending on how you choose your quantifiers, one can formulate two questions. Uh, what are the groups uh, such that the Poisson boundary is trivial for a certain probability measure? So that's the existence quantifier. And what are the groups for which the Poisson boundary is trivial for all step distributions? This is the uh, the other point prior. <laughs> okay, so now uh, let me first address uh, A. Let me first address A, and I had already announced uh, the claim that actually this class of groups has very, very natural interpretation, and namely that's precisely the class of amenable groups. So I have already explained that uh, if uh, the Poisson boundary is trivial, if the Poisson boundary is trivial, then uh, actually it means uh, something in terms of the convolution powers. It means that these convolution powers are asymptotically invariant. Why? Because triviality of the Poisson boundary, that's a general fact, which is true not only for groups, for an entry Markov chain, Triviality of the Poisson boundary is equivalent to asymptotic independence of the one-dimensional distributions of our uh, Markov chain of uh, starting points. Uh, some probabilists, uh, as I uh, learned last week, some probabilists call it merging. Uh, but, yeah, actually this property has been around much earlier. Uh, Okay, so uh, the problem is the following. Suppose that we know that our group is amenable, uh, which means that indeed for, we can uh, choose a sequence of uh, probability measures which is asymptotically invariant like this. The problem is uh, how to make the uh, sequence, the sequence of convolution powers. So, in other words, what happens is the following. Uh, well, we know that amenability means that uh, there exist uh, almost invariant sets. So, given any finite subset in the group, uh, there exists a finite set K such that uh, the translates of the set K by A are almost the same. So that uh, the, let's say, if one takes the product AK and takes its symmetric difference with K, then it is smaller than epsilon times the size of K. Okay, so we know that uh, such almost invariance exists, but uh, the problem is uh, to make sure that uh, we can choose uh, the step distribution of our random walk in such a way that such asymptotic invariance will uh, survive if we take convolutions. Because here, for any g, we want ultimately this limit uh, to be zero, to have a convergence to invariance uh, to show that this group is amenable. And here I'm going to use, uh, well, actually, this result was proved uh, more than 40 years ago, uh, 
There was one uh, proof given by myself and Vershek, another one pretty similar given by uh, Rosenblatt independently. Uh, today I will uh, present a slightly, uh, well, a somewhat modified uh, version of this argument. Uh, because also I'm going to use it for uh, the second statement. So uh, what I'm going to use, I'm going to use uh, some um, probabilistic stuff. Namely, I'm going to use certain pretty elementary facts concerning records of independent, identically distributed random variables, which has been the end of uh, probabilists since the times of uh, Bernoulli. Uh, okay, so uh, let's suppose uh, we, uh, our integer, uh, our random variables are integer valued. Uh, that's the distribution, and then I just look at the corresponding sequence, so x1, x2, and so on. And now uh, I'm going to consider, which is also a variable subject uh, in probability theory, I'm going to consider the uh, sequence of record times and the associated record values along this uh, sequence of random variables. So how do I define them? Well, that's very easy. Well, that's like uh, financial analysts who tell us about uh, oil prices. They say that, uh, well, the price has achieved a new record, which means that uh, we have a new value which haven't been observed before. And that's precisely what uh, this definition is. So we start at time zero from the record value zero, which is uh, reasonable, and then we are looking for the first moment of time when uh, the, value, uh, the values of our sequence, the first value of our sequence, which is greater than zero, okay? This is the first record time and the first record value. Okay, then we fix this record and look uh, for the next value, which will exceed the previous one, and so on and so forth. Very nice. Now, what I need is uh, the following fact, that actually one can uh, relate the record times and the uh, record value uh, by this inequality. Now, uh, in other words, what does it mean? It means the following, that if our distribution is infinitely supported, of course, if it is finitely supported, then uh, starting from a certain moment, we won't have any new records. But if our distribution is infinitely supported, then uh, we cannot wait for very long for uh, the next record to appear. Which, uh, because what happens if the next record doesn't appear? It means that all the values which we observe, uh, they are smaller than the, uh, or equal than the previous record. Okay, so we will only be sampling from a part of our um, distribution, and one cannot do it for very long, because the probability will eventually decay exponentially, and then by uh, playing a little bit with the uh, barrel cantelle lemma, which is our favorite tool, uh, one can ob obtain that, depending on the explicit form of this distribution, one can always find a certain function such that eventually, of course, one cannot say that uh, this will be uh, satisfied starting from the very beginning, but eventually, uh, uh, except for finitely many values, this inequality will be satisfied. This inequality will be satisfied. Okay, and now I uh, use uh, this uh, observation in order to uh, construct a probability measure with the trivial Poisson boundary. So what I do is uh, the following. I take a family, I will define a family of probability measures on the group. Uh, with the following property, with the following property. So let me denote the supports by EN. Uh, and then I will assume for simplicity that's not really necessary. Well, I think it is necessary, so these uh, supports are finite. So all these measures are finitely supported. That's important. 
And uh, what is less important, I will also assume that their supports are And also, uh, to make sure that our measure is non-degenerate, uh, one can also assume that the union of these sets is uh, the whole group. It's the whole group. Uh, OK, so how do I uh, construct all this? I start, let's say, from a set K1 and uh, the corresponding measure lambda 1, supported on K1, doesn't matter. And then inductively, I choose uh, the measure lambda in the following way. It has to satisfy the condition that it is asymptotically invariant with respect to uh, sufficiently long products of uh, the elements from the supports of the previous measures. I can always do this because, well, this set although it is very, very big, it is still finite. And therefore, uh, well, here I have written the definition of uh, amenability in terms of Fellner sets, but actually I need it in terms of measures. So I need so-called day, or sometimes it's called writer condition. So uh, given any, so how does it look in terms of measures? given any finite subset of the group, uh, there exists a measure lambda such that it's translates by the elements of the subset are less than any given number epsilon. Okay, so that's the uh, day or uh, writer condition. So once I fix any finite subset on the group, and actually, uh, I can consider it as a generating set as well. And then the claim is that then there exists a measure such that it is almost invariant with trans, uh, translates by uh, all elements from my finite set. So uh, in particular, I can take the uniform distribution on the associated Schoner set. OK, so uh, that precisely. Uh, uh, the condition which I need in order to define my measures lambda n, and then I put uh, the measure la, uh, mu, the measure mu, capital of n. That's uh, that's this one. That, that's why uh, you know there is a reason why I was talking about this. <laughs> yeah, that's precisely this one. Yeah. Huh? Huh? Yes, it's okay. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, how can I do this? Because here, you see, all these measures are finitely supported. Okay, and here, uh, this one can also be chosen to be finitely supported because I can uh, cut it off. And then I can, uh, this one can be translated on the right. Yeah, anywhere. So I can move it very, very far apart. And then, uh, well, since I still want uh, to cover the whole group, I can add something really very, very small elsewhere. Okay, and now I define my measure as uh, the uh, convex combination of these measures lambda n with the weights uh, p. Okay, and now uh, how uh, does one proceed? How does one proceed? Uh, one can do the following. So here I have my uh, sequence of stopping times for uh, the uh, sequence of independent, identically distributed integer value trend and variables. 
And here, when I run my random walk, I have group valued random variables. However, uh, since I made the support pairwise due joint, uh, whenever I see a group element, I can immediately say which of the set A uh, it belonged. Okay? Therefore, I have actually a map which allows me to recover which of the element, which of the measures uh, lambda n, to the support of which of the measures lambda n my element belongs. Okay? Therefore, if I have the uh, sequence of, okay, so my position at time n is one where h are the increments of the random walk. And then for each of these increments, I can consider the uh, corresponding uh, index, the corresponding uh, number of the set k to which it belongs. So it gives me as well a sequence of integer valued random variables x. Uh, whose distribution is precisely my distribution, uh, where was it, my distribution uh, P, my distribution P here, yeah. Okay. And now uh, what can I do? I can run uh, my uh, random walk. So once again, what's uh, the uh, procedure? So I start from here, actually, from this blackboard. So I choose an infinitely supported distribution on integers. And then I take the corresponding function phi from this estimate. Okay? Then I uh, throw in my amenable group and construct a sequence of probability measures like this, where I'm the function phi coming from this IID sequence. Okay? And now I define my probability measure as a convex combination of these ones with the weights given by the original distribution on the integers. So that then uh, when I look at the increments of the random walk, then I also can see the associated sequence of uh, p-distributed random variables. Okay? And now I will do the following. Here I have uh, stopping times for this sequence of independent identically distributed random variables. And therefore, it means that I also have stopping times for my original random walk. Right? So uh, I have, uh, and let me denote the distribution at the time I stop. So that's the measure mu tk. That's the measure, measure mu tk. So I have stopping time. I have stopping time, and I stop my random walk at this uh, moment. And I look at the distribution. Okay, now, uh, so what happens at the stopping time? So eventually, eventually, I will have a certain record value. And before I have, therefore, all the values which are smaller than the record values. But it means precisely that the product of the uh, corresponding uh, increments, the product of the corresponding increments, won't really affect the uh, component of my measure mu, which corresponds to this uh, record value. Okay? So for this measure mu tk, I therefore have the following property, that if I take, I fix any group element, let's say from the very beginning, and then uh, when I look at the shifts, at the translates of this measure mu to k, then I notice that they will, as k goes to infinity, they will become asymptotically invariant. Okay, so now uh, still I don't have convolution powers. I don't have convolution powers, but I'm very close. I'm very close because Because actually, actually, the Poisson boundary, 
determined by this uh, stop measure is precisely the same as the Poisson boundary of the original measure. So this is uh, uh, mark of stopping times. Actually, uh, there is a lot of them. Uh, simplest example of a stopping time is just a deterministic stopping time. When, therefore, when we stop our random walk, let's say after 10 steps. So in this case, this mark of stopping time is just constant, and I'm claiming that the Poisson boundary of my convolution power is uh, of the tenth convolution power is the same as that of the original measure. So here it's more complex because my stopping time is uh, not constant. Uh, however, this result is still uh, true. Uh, the easiest way to see it is the following. Let's consider the following model situation. Uh, suppose that G is the Free group, or rather, uh, free group generated by uh, generated by uh, the support of my measure u. And here, uh, I'm saying that it is generated by the support. I mean that it is free generated by all elements from the support. So, for instance, if I have two inverse elements, then they will be two different generators. So, therefore, in this case, my uh, random walk is just uh, the simple random walk on a uh, free um, semi-group, on a free semi-group, on a free semi-group. And in this case, uh, the Poisson boundary is Obvious, we don't have any cancellations. We don't have any cancellations, and moreover, our uh, transitions are uh, just nearest neighbor transitions. So it's obvious that the Poisson bound consists just of the space of all infinite words. So that's really nothing happening here. So we, we don't really have any group or semi group structure. It's entirely uh, Combinatorial structure, so we just concatenate uh, letters. Okay, so now uh, what happens when we apply our uh, stopping time? Then the Poisson boundary is the same. Why? Because if we have an infinite word, then by looking at this infinite word, we can uniquely recover all the stopping times, and therefore no information will be lost or uh, will be lost or. Okay, so for uh, this very, very special case, of course, uh, the uh, claim is true that the Poisson boundaries are the same. Now, uh, how does it imply uh, the general case? Well, there is a general correspondence between random walks on groups and their Poisson boundaries. And random walks on their quotient groups. So suppose that we have uh, a certain normal subgroup in our group G, and we consider the corresponding quotient uh, group. Then, of course, on the quotient group, we will also have uh, the quotient measure. And now, how is the uh, Poisson boundary, what happens through the Poisson boundary under this operation? Well, the answer is very simple. What one has to do, one just has to take the original Poisson boundary upstairs and take the space of ergodic components with respect to the action of the normal subgroup. Why? That's almost trivial because uh, if we have a harmonic function here, we can always lift it upstairs to an H invariant function. Okay, conversely, if we have an H invariant 
obviously it descends down there. In other words, if we now interpret it in the language of the Poisson boundaries, it means that functions on the Poisson boundary of the quotient random walk are precisely H invariant functions on the Poisson boundary upstairs. Okay. And now since uh, we have established this coincidence in the universal case, universal in the uh, category theory, since the one which uh, covers everything, then by uh, passing to the questions with respect to appropriate subgroups, it implies also that uh, these Poisson boundaries coincide uh, for an arbitrary random walk. Arbitrary random walk. Okay, and now, uh, now there is one more step left, which is very simple. Very simple. Namely, uh, uh, so these Poisson boundaries coincide. So, in particular, in particular, if I take my measure mu t t k and act uh, by this measure on the harmonic measure on the Poisson boundary, uh, uh, the result will be the same harmonic measure on the Poisson boundary. That's mu stationarity property for the Poisson boundary. So, in case we are talking about the original random walk, that's precisely what allows us to write the Poisson formula to claim that the resulting uh, functions are harmonic. And now, since I know that this is also the harmonic measure for the random walk governed by this measure, I also have this relation. And now uh, let's look at the difference between our harmonic measure and its corresponding translate. Okay, then uh, I can rewrite it like this. Okay, I can rewrite it like this. And now here, uh, obviously, so I can evolve something with my measure nu, but the result of this uh, convolution doesn't exceed uh, the difference between uh, what I can evolve my measure with. Right? Therefore, for any key, for any stopping moment, uh, for any stopping time, we have this inequality. We have this inequality. However, these guys go to zero. These guys go to zero. Because that's just the step distribution of my random walk. And here it is already the uh, first step distribution, which is almost invariant. And therefore, uh, the difference between these two guys it goes to zero has to be zero, has to be zero, which means that actually there are no non-constant bounded harmonic functions, right? Because if I write the Poisson formula, I integrate with respect to the translates of the measure nu, but all the same. So this is only possible when the Poisson boundary consists of a single point, and this is precisely what I uh, wanted to prove. Okay, so that's the uh, amenability part. That's the amenability part. And now uh, I'm going to address the uh, second question. The second question, when is Poisson boundary trivial for all random walks on the group? And here, as I said, the answer was obtained recently by four uh, offers, uh, Omerta Mus, Yair Hartman, uh, Joshua Frisch, and Vahidi uh, Ferdosi. Uh, so I will explain their result, but actually I will prove more. I will uh, identify the Poisson boundary in this situation, and this identification is quite uh, interesting. Okay, so uh, what are the groups? for which the Poisson boundary is always trivial. Always trivial. Actually, so far, I haven't uh, proved any results in this direction. 
And now I'm going to give a sufficient condition to belong to this class. So uh, if we have a group G, then one can talk about its center. In other words, the center of a group is the set of all elements which uh, compute with anyone else. Which compute with anyone else. Now one can uh, write this uh, definition is a slightly different form. It means that Let's say g minus 1 cg is equal to c for any g and p. OK, now what I have here is called the conjugation of the element c by the element g. And the collection of all such elements is called the conjugacy class. So in other words, in other words, uh, the center of the group G is uh, the collection of all the elements whose conjugacy class consists just of themselves. And now one can go a little bit further, a little bit further, and define the notion of uh, FC center, F from the word finite. That's the collection of all elements of our group. Such that the conjugacy class these elements is finite. So this is what is called FC center. So it's kind of natural uh, extension, but uh, uh, it turns out, it turns out that this is precisely what one needs in this situation. And uh, it turns out let's say them. The action of the FC center of any group G on its Poisson boundary is trivial for any uh, technical assumption, but okay, I will write. But I want, uh, OK, let me write it. For any non-degenerate measure mu. So non-degenerate here, that's uh, a technical condition, but actually it's important. Without it, it doesn't work. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into detail. So non-degenerate means that the semi-group generated by the support of our measure is the whole group G. So it may still happen that our measure, the support of our measure generates a whole group in the group. So we, are sti we still have to take this whole group into consideration, but not as a semi-group. And then this uh, property may actually fail. Uh, OK, how does one prove this? This result is actually due to uh, Azincourt. from 1970. But uh, it would require some effort uh, to find it there. The reason being that uh, at that time, people were only interested in random walks on locally compact, or to be more honest, on uh, groups. And therefore, uh, he never talked about countable groups. However, if one specializes uh, some of his results to countable groups, which, in which case, of course, they become much simpler, 
And then one recovers uh, this property. Okay, so uh, how does one prove this result? So let me remind you that if we have a bounded harmonic function, then uh, it converges almost all sample paths. And then uh, there is a little technical modification. Namely, uh, one can make uh, the sequence along which we consider the values of our harmonic function uh, slightly different. Namely, here one can multiply by a certain element from the uh, support of the measure. And the lemma which I need is that the limit of f of g n g also exists and is equal to the limit of f of g n uh, almost surely whenever g belongs to the support of our measure mu. So I will uh, skip the proof. It is based on uh, the fact that f is a martingale, and uh, well, it uses uh, what's called uh, ah. I gave it. Ah, you gave it. Let's take the Ah, well, okay. It gives me an excuse. It gives me an excuse. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, you see how interconnected uh, our lectures are. Uh, okay, yeah, so, uh, but I'm sure you were not talking about good groups, right? You were not talking about Okay, 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 very nice. Okay, then uh, now uh, what uh, happens if uh, our G, if our G is an element which is uh, um, which has a finite conjugacy class. Then what happens is that we can consider the random walk on its conjugacy class like this. However, the conjugacy class is finite. And this random walk has uh, the counting measure as its uh, stationary measure. And therefore, it will be recurrent. It will return to uh, the starting point, which is g infinitely often. OK, and then what does it mean? It means that g, g n, is equal to g n G, infinitely often. Okay. And now uh, both these sequences converge. This converges because this is also a sample path of a random walk, starting not from the identity but from the point G, so it also converges almost everywhere. And this one converges due to uh, that lemma. Now, where do they converge? So these... Uh, if we look at the values of our harmonic function, uh, I can still write there. So f of g, g n, converges to the value of the associated function on the Poisson boundary at the point g gamma, where gamma is the limit point of the sequence g n. And The sequence, uh, the values of our harmonic function along the sequence g and g, as it follows from that lemma, converge to f hat of gamma. So gamma is precisely the limit point of the 
simple path Gn. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that, well, since these limits coincide, it means that these values also coincide. And they always coincide for any bounded harmonic function. Or, in other words, for any bounded measurable function on the Poisson boundary. And for any um, G uh, which has a finite conjugacy class. Which means that actually, of course, this can only happen if these points are actually the same. Which means that the action of the FC center on the Poisson boundary is trivial. Okay, so now what one can do is the following. So we have our group G, and we have FC center of G, which is a normal subgroup of G. Right? And I uh, have already formulated this property about what happens when we factorize our group by its normal subgroup. The Poisson boundary of the quotient random walk is the Poisson boundary of the original random walk, quotient by the normal subgroup. However, in this situation, the action of our normal subgroup is trivial. And therefore, nothing happens here. The space of ergodic components of this action is just the original space. OK, so now uh, what can one do? One can, after having a factorized by the FC center of our group, one can again look at the FC center of the quotient group, and so on and so forth. Moreover, one can take this in, uh, uh, increasing sequence of normal subgroups and take their union. And this union will also be acting trivial on the Poisson boundary. Or in other words, one can take the omega FC center, where omega is the first infinite uh, ordinal, and uh, the quotient by uh, this uh, omega FC center will also be trivial. And then one can again take FC center again, again, and again, and this is what is called transfinite induction. And then finally uh, we stop in uh, transfinitely more. Uh, then uh, what we obtain is called the uh, hyper FC center of our group. And as I have just indicated, its action on the Poisson boundary is trivial. So in particular, if a group coincides with its hyper FC center, then the Poisson boundary is trivial. Then the Poisson boundary is trivial. If not, if not, one can quotient by this hyper FC center. And then uh, what is the property of this quotient? It doesn't have any finite conjugacy classes, because if it had, we could have continued here further. So this is the maximal quotient of G with infinite conjugacy Classes. Okay, so now uh, what I have proved is the following. What I have proved is the following, that if our group is hyper FC central, if it coincides with its, uh, hyper FC center, then the Poisson boundary is trivial for any measure. And the Poisson boundary is trivial for any measure. This result actually 
in various modifications, of course, it covers a billion. That's uh, where uh, this Louisville theory was first established by Blackwell. Then it was extended to nilpotent groups. And here I have to say that for finitely generated groups, uh, this class of hyper-FT groups coincides with the uh, virtually, virtually nilpotent groups, or in other words, with the class of groups of polynomial growth. And ultimately, it was extended to, um, well, it was noticed, I should say, without really uh, diminishing the uh, value of uh, these extensions. Uh, it was uh, ultimately extended uh, to the generality of hyper-FC uh, groups by uh, Lin, Zeidenberg, and uh, Iworski. And now uh, the achievement of uh, the four offers which I uh, had quoted earlier was that they have shown that not only this condition is sufficient for boundary triviality of any random walk, but it is also necessary. It is also necessary. Namely, what we, they did was uh, the following. So here, as I have explained, uh, the quotient of any group but its hyper-FC center is uh, an ICC group, a group of infinite conjugacy classes. And therefore, in order to prove this theorem in the opposite direction, what one has to do is the following. One has to prove that any ICC group has a random walk with a triple Poisson boundary. So uh, this is the result of the four offers, and now I will explain not the original proof, but actually I will uh, prove uh, something stronger. So that's um, okay. Not sure I'm uh, okay. Uh, Tamus Hartman uh, Frisch not alphabetical, uh, and Wahidi Dolce. That's one person. Uh, so instead, I will uh, prove uh, the following uh, result, which is due to, which is very recent, and which is due to uh, And uh, and myself, which uh, actually not only claims that the Poisson boundary is non-trivial, but explicitly describes this Poisson boundary, and it turns out that it has uh, quite interesting properties. So, let me at least formulate the theorem. Uh, there exists. Okay, so uh, let G be an ICC group. Then uh, there exist a look finite forest in G. So let me first write down the formulation, and then I will explain in more detail. And a probability measure mu uh, with the following properties, with the following properties. Locally forest, let's say F. 
with the following properties. First, uh, the sample paths of the random walk converge to the boundary of this forest. Uh, the second property is that this is what I call trunk convergence. So what does it mean? It means the following. This convergence is actually like the convergence to the space of ends for the simple random walk on a tree. So what happens when we do simple random walk on a tree? doesn't have to be a homogeneous tree. If we know that this random walk is transient, so that the sample paths converge to infinity, then if we look the corresponding jet, well, I say the corresponding geodesic uh, because I'm fixing uh, the origin, say. Okay, so I have a sample path Gn, which converges to a boundary point. Then uh, this sample path has to pass eventually through all the points of this geodesic ray. And in particular, this very fact, uh, I'm talking about nearest neighbor random walk. So if it converges to a point at infinity, obviously it cannot jump. Elephants don't jump. Uh, so uh, it has to pass through all the points along this geodesic ray. And this, actually, this very fact automatically implies that in this situation, the Poisson boundary is indeed the space of infinite words. Because if we have any two uh, sample paths which converge to the same boundary point, then they all have to pass through the same point. And therefore, the limits of harmonic functions along these sample paths have to be the same. So nothing can split there. So uh, the claim is that in this case, we have this kind of convergence. And as I have just explained, it implies that the boundary of the forest endowed with the corresponding heating map is the Poisson boundary. And finally, uh, the last statement is that formally it still doesn't imply triviality of the Poisson boundary because, let's say, in principle, it could have happened that uh, this heating distribution is sitting on a single point. Uh, the action of our group G on the boundary of the forest is free. Well, no, maybe not on the border of the forest. Let's say on this Poisson boundary is this Poisson boundary is free. Namely, uh, almost all stabilizers are trivial, and of course, it, clue, it completely excludes the possibility that this Poisson boundary is uh, trivial. Okay, so uh, let me explain a little bit. So first of all, uh, what is a forest? What is a forest? A forest is a collection of trees. A forest is a collection of trees, and tree, as it is well known, is a graph, connected graph without cycles. So I just have a bunch of trees in my group, and this will be my forest. Okay, then uh, I would like to emphasize that a priori, this forest has nothing to do with the group structure. There is, uh, it is not supposed to be invariant with respect to the action of the group. The graph structure is not preserved by the group action. Well, there is a uh, price to pay because, of course, not every group can be uh, treated uh, 
in an equivariant way. Okay, then uh, what do I mean uh, by the boundary of the forest? That's very simple. Each of the trees has its own boundary. And the union of these boundaries of the trees which uh, make our forest is the boundary of the forest, is the boundary of the forest. Okay, now uh, here I'm still talking about an action. So, yes. Huh? For trees, yeah, the boundary is, uh, well, kind of, uh, boundary of trees was before Gromov, but uh, yeah, if you wish, yes. Huh? Well, uh, in this particular case, they're all infinite because uh, I'm talking about their boundaries, yes. Yeah, trees are, uh, well, I'm talking about convergence, uh, so yeah, they have to be infinite. We'll eventually choose some tree and then, uh, yes, precisely. That's the uh, topology in this first. Okay, so now, um, how do I, have an action. How do I still re relate this picture with, uh, uh, with the group structure? In the following way. So uh, what is the boundary of a single tree? That's a class of equivalent, uh, it can be considered as a class of equivalent sequence. Sequences namely as uh, the collection of all geodesic rays which convert to uh, the given point. So, and now what I do is the following. I do is the following. So I take one of these geodesic rays, I take one of these geodesic rays, and take all of its translates. Okay. I take all of its translates. And nothing guarantees me that one or any uh, of these translates will also be just decreased. However, I only retain those ones such that for any group element, the corresponding translate is also uh, asymptotically equivalent to another just decrease. Okay, so in other words, I'm taking the uh, maximal G invariant subset of this boundary. Uh, well, this, uh, well, one has to pay for everything, so here the price is, uh, in particular, that this G invariant part, it won't be closed. Won't be closed, but, but still it's a barrel set, it's uh, reasonable. Well, as you know, one really has to uh, make, to work really very hard in order to obtain a non-barrel set. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so uh, this is uh, the forest, this is the boundary of the forest, and I think uh, I have explained enough concerning the formulation of this theorem. And now how uh, do we prove this theorem? So it is based on considering a special structure our group, which I call a ladder. So, and it will be kind of an infinite ladder, like Jacob's ladder. Uh, so what uh, does it consist of? Uh, there are two ingredients. It's a sequence of sets sigma n, and a certain function called gauge function. So I call a gauge function. Okay, and then uh, with respect to this structure, I can consider in my uh, group the uh, what I call spike decompositions. So what is this? Okay. 
That's a representation of my group element as a product of the elements. So this is prefix, this is postfix, and this is the spike uh, with the following property. The spike belongs to one of these sets uh, sigma n. Okay. Whereas both the prefix and the postfix, their products of the elements from the previous sets. So it actually reminds very much the uh, construction from the uh, first part of my talk. So uh, this, uh, the prefix and the postfix, both belong to the union of sigma 1 and so on, sigma n minus 1, to the power lambda of n. So, uh, well, this is indeed like a spike. So we have a certain element, which is bigger, and it's surrounded by the smaller ones. So it's something like this. OK, and now, uh, if such a decomposition exists, I will call this number n here the uh, like height. Well, not if such a decomposition exists. Of course, if such a decomposition exists and is unique, uh, I am allowed to really take the spike of this decomposition and say that it is associated to my group elements. And so the conditions which I uh, impose on this uh, sequence to give me a ladder structure. Other first, the spike decomposition is unique. And second, uh, this uh, uh, spike height is strictly decreasing under the spike decomposition. for any group element. OK, so if a spike decomposition doesn't exist, then there is nothing I can do. And I, in this case, I declare that the spike height is equal to 0. Okay. And then it turns out that these two conditions, these two conditions, provide me with a graph structure. So what's the graph structure on my group? That's just pairs of group elements, which consist of an element and of the prefix of its spike decomposition. Okay, so these are the edges of my forest. Of course, here one has to show that this indeed is a forest, but it's really uh, not very difficult by using these conditions. So this is a forest, yeah. Huh? Which sets? Uh, which sets? Uh, no, no, they're not, they're not. Uh, ah, sorry, sorry, of course they're disjoint because uh, uh, how come this spike decomposition will be unique if uh, they're not? Yeah, of course they are disjoint. So uh, the point is uh, that we have, uh, this is a sequence of elements which are uh, sequence of sets which grow very, very fast. So that if we have in our product just one element from uh, sigma n, then all the previous ones, they're just uh, midgets compared to this one even if we multiply them, uh, well, a certain reasonable number of times. So of course, they're all uh, different. They're all different. OK, so uh, huh? it will appear just now, yes, yes. 
Okay, and now so, uh, how does it uh, relate to random walks? So uh, let me return to our records. Let me return to our records. Let me take a probability distribution on integers. And as before, I will consider the record times. and the corresponding record values. And now, uh, in the uh, first part of my talk, I could take just an uh, unbounded distribution on the integers, whereas here I will need it to satisfy one more additional condition, which is that the records are eventually simple. So what does it mean? It means uh, the following. It means the following. It means the following. So well, that's my sequence. So I have achieved a new record have achieved new record, and then there will be a certain new record. Now, what can happen is that in between, I can repeat. I can tie my previous value several more times. Okay. Or, and this is what I call simplicity of records, each new record uh, will be attained without repeating the previous one. Okay, so uh, the picture, therefore, will be the same. Uh, all the values between two consecutive records will be actually smaller than the previous one. Oops. And then go to the top. So that's, uh, this condition is also known in probability, and uh, one can write explicitly under which assumptions on this sequence it will be satisfied. And there the uh, answer is more or less intuitively clear. If, uh, our, uh, if our distribution has a very uh, fast uh, decay, if our distribution has very fast decay, then it, is, it looks almost like a finitely supported distribution. And there, of course, we cannot expect to have this property. However, uh, once again, that's an explicit condition, uh, which can be verified, for instance, to be satisfied for all distributions with polynomial decay. Okay, for instance, satisfied if T is polynomial. Okay, and now, as Mahan has already guessed, I'm going to link uh, these two parts by uh, using uh, the same function phi capital, which uh, has already appeared before. I will need slightly different function, but it's essentially the same. Because I want to estimate not uh, on the record time, but I want the estimate for, uh, for the next record time, which can also be done in pretty much the same way. Okay, so in other words, what do I want to know? Uh, once I have achieved a certain record, I have an upper bound on for how long I have to wait until the next one. And then I just take this function phi as the gauge function of my letter. I take this uh, phi as the gauge function of my letter. And then uh, what happens with the random walk? What happens with the random walk? happens with the random walk is the following, that uh, suppose I have achieved a certain record value here. 
Okay? We achieved a certain record value here. Then all the increments before, they will belong to a smaller set. Okay? And at least until I reach the next record you are. All the increments here will also be uh, from the previous sets, and their number will also be uniformly bounded. So in other words, for all uh, moments of time between say, tk and tk plus 1, the uh, spike decomposition of uh, the position of my random walk and time n uh, will have the same spike, will have the same spike, which will correspond to uh, this record, which will correspond to this record. And uh, this, in terms of my tree, this means precisely that uh, the sample path converges to the uh, boundary of the tree. Okay, so now uh, what is uh, left? So first of all, here I had promised to, in the formulation, I had promised uh, that the boundary action is free. Well, that's not hard to see, but will require some more time. Second, probably the more interesting question is, how does one construct these letters? Because so far I haven't really mentioned ICC groups now. And, uh, the trick is the following. ICC groups have the following uh, nice properties. So in ICC groups, the conjugacy classes are infinite, which means that, their group, that these groups are quite non-commutative. Namely, uh, the following property is satisfied. So I say that definition a set uh, sigma is that if Okay, so given a certain uh, set Z in my group, I'm uh, looking for another set sigma with the property that uh, if I multiply elements from these two sets, uh, then these products will always be uh, different, except for trivial reasons, except for trivial reasons. So now if I can find sets with this property, then I can also uh, find uh, the, then I can also construct the letters which required in my argument. And here, in order to satisfy uh, this condition, one is able to satisfy this condition for increased sequence of sets, and this is due to ICC uh, property, but uh, I think I have to stop now. Thank you.